For the rundown on WNYU 89.1 FM, I'm Claudia Frank. In the lead-up to the 2016 presidential election, there was a lot of talk on fact-checking and holding candidates accountable for their statements during the debates. Gleb Sapersky believes there is a whole other dimension to fact-checking that we ought to examine. So I'm a professor at Ohio State in a decision scientist collaborative and in the history department specializing in the history of behavioral science. And I'm also the president of Intentional Insights, a nonprofit that popularizes behavioral science research for a broad audience. He has written a piece entitled Fact-Checking Doesn't Matter on this Subject and currently does research at the intersection of psychology, behavioral economics, and cognitive neuroscience at Ohio State. I spoke with Professor Sapersky on this subject. First, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, what are your thoughts in light of the recent election of President Trump? Is there anything you want to say about that at all? Or So I think... President-elect Trump has done a wonderful job of using emotional intelligence and charisma to appeal to people's emotions. He knows very well how human beings are wired, how our minds are mostly emotional. We typically think of ourselves as rational, reasonable creatures. However, research shows that about maybe 80% of our decision-making is emotion-driven, and we don't realize it. We think that we're making decisions logically. Actually, we're making decisions overwhelmingly emotionally. And President-elect Trump has done a great job of appealing to those emotions, of appealing to people's emotions in a way they don't realize they're being appealed to, and using his charisma and his emotional intelligence to get people to vote for him. Right. I mean, do you think that this is like a special election in terms of that? Or do you think American politics have always been ruled by this kind of emotional appeal and kind of emotional manipulation, I guess? Sure. We've definitely always had emotions always play a role, like I said, in all sorts of decision making. They are most of what drive us, which is this is why we take a second slice of chocolate cake when we right. don't think we should. <laughs> rationally or reasonably, or why we yell at our loved ones in a situation that we later regret. These are driven by emotion. <laughs> now, so this is you know, many examples. Now, President elect Trump has done a really good job of appealing to our emotions in a unique way that has not been done by press candidates, and this is why. So he is not a traditional politician. And he doesn't really care about the stability and maintenance of the system of public discourse, of how we talk about politics. So he was very capable of going out and lying and deceiving people. We have numerous records of him being, having numerous, numerous false statements, deceptive statements, things that appeal to people's emotions, but are actually false, not true. And he repeats things a number of times. And there's a one type of thinking error, which is called by psychologists the illusion, the illusory truth effect, where if a lie is repeated often enough, we believe it took, we come to believe it's true, despite it still being a lie. So, for example, he repeated very many times that NAFTA is the worst trade deal ever, 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 ever. <laughs> and so people, many people came to believe that, even though NAFTA experts really disagree on whether NAFTA is good or bad, certainly no one among the experts would say it's the worst trade deal ever. I mean, do you think there's any chance that he starts to downplay some of his more bombastic rhetoric as president? Or do you think we're just going to be seeing a lot more of this over the next four or even eight years? The evidence so far clearly shows that we're going to be seeing a lot more. Uh, we, He has after the election, he has attacked the Hamilton musical actors for making a statement um, that expressed their concerns about the future of the country to Vice President Pence, who was in the audience. We have never had a president who did something like that. So you're not very optimistic. <laughs> oh, well, I only go based on the evidence. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that he's lying if he wasn't lying. I wouldn't say that he doesn't care about the truth if he didn't care about the truth. You know, I can only go based on what 
what he's saying and looking at the evidence and then making an analytical conclusion from an objective academic perspective. So that's right. what I do. Right. <laughs> you know, um, I call it I call it state of state, but if you know, if I don't have a state to call it state, I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, makes sense. Um, I want to switch a little bit over to talking about the fallacy checking that you discuss in your article. Um, I was wondering what would fallacy checking as opposed to fact checking, which we've seen a lot of, um, what would fallacy checking actually look like, especially in regards to real time events like debates? Sure. Uh, excellent question. So I actually did. So let me, uh, for your readers, listeners who didn't read the piece, it's uh, on the conversation of the conversation that come where you can go to my, our website, intentionalinsights.org, and look for fallacy checking. And that would be the title of the article. I and mean, you can look for fallacy checking on Gleb Tuborsky. You can Google that. But intentionalinsights.org has the content that Intentional Insights produces. And so fallacy checking, how that would look like, is people who are aware of how our brains are wired and miswired being commentators and checking in on the debate. So, for example, I did some live tweeting of fallacy checking. And let's take an example. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, we need to make sure that this is not only about Trump. This is about all candidates. So right. let's go to Hillary Clinton. So in one of the debates, she called Trump Putin's puppet. Now, that's a hard statement, and that's not something a fact checker can check at all. Now, you can't go and, you know, obviously she did not mean that Putin has his hand up Donald Trump's buttocks and is <laughs> manipulating Donald Trump like a puppet. That is not what she meant. And so there's no way a fact checker can state that. But what is actually happening when she calls Donald Trump Putin's puppet? Well, that's a very emotional statement that goes to the part of our selves that actually makes most of our decisions. And what happens is what's something that's known as the Horns effect. The Horns effect is when we associate something negative with one part of a whole, we associate it with all parts of that whole. So if we associate negative feelings with um, puppets, so being a puppet is certainly something that people perceive as negative, and most of us don't have a very favorable opinion of Vladimir Putin. So. Hillary Clinton, what she did was use those two associations to and get us to associate these things with Donald Trump. And so get transfer negative emotions from Putin and, Putin and the puppets to Donald Trump. And what we need to do at that moment, the only way to prevent us from actually decreasing our opinion of Donald Trump based not on something that he did based not on any evidence but based essentially on an emotional attack i don't uh, an attack on him from an emotional perspective the only way to prevent that is to be aware okay this is what's going on hillary clinton is using the horns effect to cause us to feel negative emotions well now that we are aware of it we can resist it we can say okay no donald trump is not actually in reality putin's puppet we can actually look at, it. well, what, what does it mean? You know, look into the evidence if he has some connections to Putin, and we can make an actual realistic evaluation based on the evidence of what's going on, not just based on some emotional associations that we have with Putin and with Puppet. Uh, in fallacy checking, can in the moment catch these things and call them out and let people know that this is something that our brains would tend to naturally fall into if we don't oppose it intentionally. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you one last question, and then you can give me sure. any other comments you might have. Um, I was wondering what you and I and other informed citizens can do to avoid falling into this trap of non-rational reasoning when we're watching the news or when we're watching debates. Like, what can we do to not be so easily tricked? So, yeah, that's a great question. I think it's going to be crucial to learn. Learn about how our biases work. Learn about how our how we make 
these very fundamental and very basic mistakes about what we do and how to, uh, and this is content, this is why I am passionate about popularizing the stuff to a broad audience. So at intentionalinsights.org, again, that's intentionalinsights.org, we have a lot of content on how people can learn about their biases and prevent them. And we are really oriented towards spreading rationality in politics. So we're trying to create content articles, videos, quizzes, tests, books, apps that would help people learn about these things and not be fooled by politicians of, you know, whether their politicians are liberal or conservative, to not be fooled by these. Because the future of American democracy is going to be very dark if we don't learn about how politicians are manipulating us. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to talk about or add on? So... Folks who want to learn about this can go to intentionalinsights.org and learn about it. And uh, welcome to reach out to me. My email is gleb at intentionalinsights.org. I'd be happy to chat with anyone who's interested in learning more. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for speaking with me today. I was really glad to speak to you, Claudia. Right. Okay. Thank you so much.